It is a black and gold Friday as the Bruins are set to meet the New York Rangers here on Friday afternoon. Uh, the Bruins also play the Canucks this coming Sunday, and you're going to be joined by uh, Canucks writer Thomas Drance here on today's podcast. So let's get into it. <laughs> Locked On Bruins, your daily podcast on the Boston Bruins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Bruins fans, and welcome back to the Locked On Boston Bruins podcast. I'm your host, Ian McLaren, and this is a daily show where we discuss all things spoke to be as well as take a look around the NHL. Today is Friday, November 26th. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Stat Hero, the first of its kind daily fantasy sports platform where it's you versus the house in head-to-head hockey fantasy matchups. Winner take all. Sign up for free right now at stathero.com. Use promo code hockey for a 100% deposit match what a deal that is uh so yeah today on the podcast gonna quickly tee up this afternoon's game against the new york rangers but before we do that happy to be joined by uh thomas drance drance is someone who i worked with uh at the score back in the day uh one of the smartest hardest working hockey people i know uh since the score Man, it's hard to keep track. Worked for Nations Network, I think, uh, Florida Panthers. Uh, He now covers the Canucks for uh, The Athletic, for Sportsnet. Uh, So, yeah, very pleased to welcome uh, Drance to the podcast today. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Good to see you, man. Did I uh, did I miss anything there? Um, nope that was that was the that was the basic (laughs) run of it. It's been uh, it's been a journey, man. It's been a lot of fun. Sure. Am I one of my favorite memories from the score is uh the olympics came up and uh you volunteer to like manually track shot attempts for every game <laughs> and i knew right then i'm like wow this guy uh yeah this guy knows what he's doing yeah that I was, was, uh, that was crazy. i remember working 18 straight days during the polar vortex uh for that <laughs> yeah. for that like that's what i really remember i also remember that they always brought in like these bagels and it was oh, the yeah, same right. type of bagel spread every day. And I like still can't eat bagels from that <laughs> store. Like it, <laughs> it just like upsets me. Um, but you know, that was a, that was an interesting, that was an interesting experiment uh, because, and, and I think it was scoring chances, not, not shot attempts oh, okay. as yeah, I recall. Yeah. But I, what, what was interesting about it, the IHF gives us no data, gives us no data right, at right, all. Right. And what was interesting about that Olympics is it, it, you'll recall like Team USA crushed everybody in right. the qualifying round right it was like tj sochi and oh, they were yeah, scoring yeah. like six goals a game and everyone was like wow team america like they have the skill <laughs> to win and canada beat norway by a goal in the in the qualifying round and then lost to finland and then barely got by latvia right, right like barely right, right. got by latvia so everyone was like this team can't score <laughs> like mike babcock plays chris kunitz on the first line what's he oh, doing man. like this team you know they should have why did they leave pk suban at home like they right, can't right, score right. was but and they didn't even leave him at home he was just scratched every game right yeah, uh, yeah but, uh, guy, right? but that was like the lead up to that canada us game was was that was the chatter like team america's this wave team canada can't score they suck and the scoring chances had Team Canada at like 80%, right? Like <laughs> literally an inhuman amount. It yeah, had yeah, Team yeah. USA at like 50%, but scoring on every shot they took. Right. And so we had we had this like coverage at the score because I'd spent all that time tracking weird like Switzerland, Latvia. Like, wow. <laughs> um, because I'd spent all that time, I was able to come in and be like, Team Canada's way better than the United States in right, every right, single right. respect. Yep. And then that game played out, and it was the most lopsided one nothing game in the history of hockey. Yeah, and oh, so that man. was good. That, I mean, that was fun, but it, it was, was very fun. But it was uh, probably not the best use of my time. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, these days, you're uh, you're covering the Vancouver Canucks. They've been one of the most talked about teams so far this season, yeah. mostly because of their awful start. Is it um, is it a, a 
case of them not meeting expectations or is this kind of what uh, you expected from this team? What's uh, what's the deal these days? I had really low expectations okay. for this team. I, I mean, coming into the season, I was doing radio hits and talking about how I didn't think they had any PK personnel. Now, did I expect historically bad? No. <laughs> but I did his- expect this team to struggle in that area, in that phase of the game. Right. Um, I didn't think that they were a playoff team because I didn't mm. think, like, I don't think you can make the playoffs with the defense like they have. Mm. And, you know, I mean, I look at practice yesterday. Travis Hamannick's not with the club at the moment. Right. Because of his, um, you know, vaccine status. Tucker Pullman can't handle the puck sufficiently well to play with Quinn Hughes or really in the top four at all. <laughs> right. Tyler Myers. I don't know if you saw that game against Pittsburgh, but if you go look at the highlights, like Tyler Myers is a bottom pair defenseman who can <laughs> fill in a little higher up the lineup on occasion. Yeah. But his defensive play leaves a lot to be desired. Um, Kyle Burroughs is like, you know, he's 350 in AHL games, like serviceable eight, nine guy. Yeah. You know, but he's playing every day for the Canucks on the left side of their third pair. Yeah. And then all of Reckman Larson's like bounced back and had a good year, but he doesn't move the needle anymore. He's a top mm-hmm. four defenseman. He's not a top pair stud. Um, and then, you know, so, so I practice yesterday, they play Quinn Hughes with Luke Shen <laughs> and I'm watching it and I'm thinking that's probably the right call. That's probably what, it's probably what they, that's probably the right call considering who they have. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's where this team's at, right? Like that's where this team's at. And so, you know, I think there were expectations in the market. I think there's more curiosity about, you know, how that top nine talent would blend. Um, and, and look, there is talent on this roster. This right. roster is not without talent. It's just not without substance. Like, mm-hmm. or, sorry, it is without substance. It is like right, a, right. It's a roster with some young names that excite fans and some interesting offensive players, but none of the types of players that help you Mm. meaningfully win games when it counts. Like no, you know, top six guy that's also a PK guy, right? There's no Brad Marchand on this team. There's no guy (laughs) who does like the little stuff in addition to being a stud scorer, right? Like they're... it's all flash. Right, right. There, there's no sort of like core of steel that helps you win games. And I mean, it's tough. Like when you're when you're built like that in this league and then things don't quite go your way and begin to snowball, like it just leaves you vulnerable. And, right. And, and I think the first the first 10 games were like really instructive where the Canucks weren't winning more than they were losing, even with elite goaltending, like 940 plus yeah. goaltending. Yeah, Dempsey's like, been amazing. Amazing. But if you're not good, like, if you can't capitalize on a stretch when you have an elite goaltending, you're hosed. You know, like, mm-hmm. I mean, the yeah, Bruins yeah. haven't had great goaltending yet this year. No. But if they got 940 goaltending, they'd be 7-3 and three or 8-2, and two, mm-hmm. right? For, yep. for a stretch of 10 games. The Canucks were like, you know, 4-5. and five. <laughs> And it's like, okay, like, that's not a good team. Um, and that's just that's just how it's gonna be here, I think, as, at least until they make changes, which everyone expects, but no one expects soon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, before I ask the next question, just a quick more about uh, Stat Hero. Nobody plays daily fantasy sports to lose. Winning feels so much better. But traditional fantasy sports are a long-term losing proposition because you never know who or what you're up against. But with Stat Hero. It's always you versus the house in a head-to-head fantasy matchup, winner take all. And Stat Hero shows you their lineups before you play, and you handpick the team that you want to face one-on-one. You can sign up for free right now, stathero.com slash hockey, and use promo code hockey for a 100% deposit match. Uh, So yeah, get on that today and uh, start playing over at Stat Hero. I was going to ask you about Ekman Larson, you already uh, already touched on him, you know, before, I guess, the beginning of last season, it was, will he go to Boston or Vancouver if he's traded? Another guy the Bruins really had their eye on was uh, was Connor Garland. How how has he looked so far in uh, in Vancouver? Yeah, Connor Garland's been excellent. I mean, he's a genuine top line rate scorer with a super unique play style, ton of ton of spins. Um, he's been he's been making to third best forward. Uh, And, and I mean, a fan favorite, right? He's been sort of a guy capable of dragging this team into the fight. Right. I think there are, 
you know, he, he doesn't play a heavy game. Obviously he's a, he's very slight as a, as a player. Um, but he's, you know, he, he plays hard and, and I do think there's, you know, two way value play driving value. I do just think he like, he plays such a unique play style that I do think it's been tough for the Canucks to find a player, mm. a center in particular who compliments him well. Right. Um, but uh, but you know we'll we'll see where he's. It looks like he's going to get some run, maybe with um, Elias Pettersson. Mm. Uh, you know over the next little bit, the club sort of went away from that after going to that in the Pittsburgh game. Partly I think to send Pettersson a message after he, he didn't play particularly well and only played twelve minutes. That's right. the point in the season we're at with the Canucks. So mm-hmm. Pettersson was like on the line with Dowling at practice uh, oh, on gosh. Thursday. But uh, but I do think we'll see more of that as Pedersen's form returns, and and it's certainly an interesting combination. What uh, yeah, what is up with with Pedersen specifically? I've I heard uh, you know on the Thirty Two Thoughts podcast the other day they were really talking about his game and saying he looks you know pretty hesitant to this season, not as uh, I don't know impactful for sure. Is it just a matter of yeah, just taking some time to get into the flow of things or, or is it something more significant going on with his game? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. And I don't know that he's sure exactly. I mm-hmm. think there's certainly a confidence aspect to it. I also think with Pedersen, you know, you're talking about a guy who's not particularly big and, you know, not a particularly fast. Right. And he's excelled in this league by – accumulating moments where he's like 2% ahead of everyone else, right? Like just like outthinking everyone mm-hmm. being just the right. smartest guy on the ice. And I think right now having had eight months off, having dealt with a pretty significant wrist injury, um, what that did in terms of impeding right. his ability to work on his shot. I think he's just a little bit off. I think he's just, he's just 2% off, but you know, a guy like uh, Josh Anderson can be 2% off. And you're not going to notice because he's still the biggest, fastest guy out there, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Whereas a guy like Pedersen, when they're 2% off, it, it really shows. And right. so that's my theory on this. However, it's been 20 games. Like, it's been yeah. 20 games into the season. Like, at some point, he's got to just get it done. Right. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see where he's at. I, I tend to think, though, he's still just shaking off some rust. Right. Um, still just a little bit hesitant a little bit yeah you know you know a little bit like lacking in confidence at this point yeah um but but the Canucks cannot win games if he right. doesn't start to play and and drive play and be right. their best player so yeah Bruins Canucks not too long ago would have been a date to circle on the calendar I've kind of <laughs> half joked uh that I'm glad that the Canucks hired Jim Benning before the Bruins fired Peter Chiarelli so that uh, he wasn't the guy to kind of replace him. Uh, Elliot Freeman reported yesterday that he heard there were some rumblings that something could happen. Do you think there could be any huge changes if, say, the Canucks lose to the the Blue Jackets tonight ahead of the game against uh, the Bruins on Sunday? Well, I wake up and I check to make sure there's no changes every morning at this point. So, yeah, I think there could be changes um, over the weekend in the event that the Canucks lose big to the Blue Jackets on on Friday. The Blue Jackets, too, have that feel of a team that, like, everyone overreacts to any loss against them this year mm-hmm. because they're yeah. rebuilding. They shouldn't be good, but they're kind of a little bit better than that, they're right? Good, so, yeah. yeah, so they, they feel like a team that's going to stimulate a lot of, um, like, closed door team meetings following losses yeah, to right. them or or perhaps or perhaps some coaching changes or what have you yeah. uh, on thursday on thursday the big sort of yeah almost every day this week in at some point <laughs> at some point my phone is exploded with clucking hens being like you got to look into this oh you got to look into this right yeah and you know on yeah Almost every day this week. And and it's usually turned out to be, if not completely untrue, then at least not <laughs> remotely imminent. Yeah. But this happened to me on Tuesday, and this happened to me again yesterday, and I think that's what Elliot's referring to. Right, right, right. And and in at the top of his 32 thoughts, he then invokes Claude Julian, yep. right? Um, which is definitely the name that started the clucking mm-hmm. hens in Vancouver. I don't think anyone's come out and said this, but it's like, right. you know, uh, ev- like, I, and look, good contacts were... T- telling me like that's the word on in the industry hmm. but as i checked into it as i looked into it i was kind of told you know 
don't don't spend a lot of time on that one and okay. um and i you know I, I, not that it's not a possibility we we all know that uh benning and julian have a relationship dating yep. back to 2011 uh dating back before that of course and you know but but i mean benning there's there's questions within the industry about whether Benning has the autonomy to make right. a trade. Yeah, should he so be you're gonna, making those calls? So you're yeah, gonna, exactly. Are you going to let a general manager you don't fully believe in beyond this season, or maybe even to finish this season, <laughs> uh, go out and hire a 14 plus million dollar head coach? Yeah, like are, is that really going to happen? And I mean, this organization in this organization and how backwards they are in terms of how they do stuff. I mean, yeah, maybe. But it doesn't make a ton of sense. Like, it doesn't make a ton of sense unless this GM is your guy, in which case you need to signal that in a way that, you know, before you before they hire the big name coach. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, this club is just stuck right now. Their rumors are abounding. People are throwing stuff on the wall. The amount of, you know, like the other thing Elliot wrote was hard to separate fact from fiction. Yeah, he's right. <laughs> Yeah. And and like there it's cuz there's different there's like 10 people trying to solve the problem all of them have different answers and they're right. jockeying for ownership to select their their answer. Right. Uh ownership meanwhile traditionally like I don't think they know what they're doing to be totally <laughs> honest with you Ian. So we're in this moment where the noise around this team is just massive. Everything right. is amplified. The players are struggling and trying to keep their head above water while sort of having their names bandied about in, right. in all manner of trade rumors. That was the my head, next question. Yeah. Yeah. The head coach, I think, you know, is day by day in terms of, well, I'm coaching again today. <laughs> you know, I will, you know, like I think, and, and that's, and that's where you get to, you get to this moment in an organization, right. Where something has to give. Right. Everyone is mad. And honestly, even even like the players are all like playing like they're just waiting for the guillotine to drop, mm, right? Yeah. And so we know it's going to be GM or coach. We don't know which one. We don't know when. And until one of those happens or the team reels off like a run of 10 games, which is really hard to do when everything is snowballing this way, <laughs> Yeah. right? Yeah. Until one of those happen, everyone just kind of winces and waits. And that's yeah. sort of where this team is at. Such a mess. This is not going to be a very good game 15 of the <laughs> yeah. 2011 Stanley Cup final, which is still ongoing in the minds <laughs> yeah. of the next day. You had that uh, tweet that kind of blew up yesterday with uh, JT Miller kind of audibly questioning what's going on during practice. Yeah. He's a but, guy that I really like as you he's know, a great player, a potential guy that, uh, you know, could be targeted in a trade. Brock Besser's name is out there. You had that piece about the, the trade tiers. Uh, I don't know if, there be uh, any kind of pipeline there for trades between between the Canucks and the Bruins, but do you see anybody on on that roster that yeah is movable and, and are they yeah it's, I guess it's hard to say based on what you just said, but it's going to be like rebuilding picks and prospects. Are they going to want something tangible in return? What's, yeah, uh, you need to know what the club's doing. The club needs to know what they're doing right. first. But, yeah. I mean, I think that guys like JT Miller, who have two years left on their deal, and Bo Horvat, who has two years left on his deal, and Brock Besser, who's an RFA this year, like, those are conversations that it makes sense to have mm -hmm. based on a wider framework of what your club wants to accomplish over the next, you know, eight years, five yeah. years. And right now the situation around this group is such that no one – can possibly feel confident in making and sketching out those plans. <laughs> right. Right. So it's like, what are we doing? And and then there's this sense, like every insider in the game will tell you that Canucks ownership plans to be patient. They don't want to make right. a mistake. And it's like, you know, it would be a mistake. You know, it'd be a mistake. Just not doing anything. <laughs> right. Like, you know, it'd be a mistake would be letting this drag out for no reason at all. Yeah. You don't have to have the hire. You can go to an interim situation. You can change course. You know, it's been a mistake the last eight years, <laughs> like figure it out. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a wild moment for yeah. hockey's most dysfunctional organization on the JT Miller thing. This happens in practices. Sometimes like a drill gets set up. I think one line was in the wrong line of the of the rink. I think it was JT Miller's line. So Trav, uh, Green sort of like is like, all right, let's go. Like blows the whistle, right? And JT Miller just yells out like, we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 
it gets sorted out with uh, Besser and Travis sort of explaining, you know, exactly how he wants it. And JT Miller's group goes to the other end of the ice. And that's that. Like, it wasn't – it it gets magnified right now right. because of where, where this team is at. But, it mm-hmm. like, it wasn't a, you know – super tense moment it wasn't a fight at practice although the connects could probably use one of those it was it was just a moment of confusion that gets amplified right now yeah and look i just thought it was funny so i yeah sent it along and it and it did happen like it's true so you know that was the thing i said i mean yeah the team loved it don sweeney in recent years has had a propensity for kind of trading for guys who have more than like not a rental type situation guys right. with control in the contract. So maybe I'll pick up and, uh, and call his old buddy there before I let you go. Want to get your thoughts kind of on this Bruins team for me. They're like locked into fourth in the Atlantic, probably battling with some Metro teams for a wild card spot. One, maybe one round, maybe that they can win uh, the window, maybe, as open as Patrice Bergeron remains around, maybe if Rask comes back, what are your general thoughts on on where this team sits right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the lo- the departure of Tuka Rask can't be over understated, mm-hmm. right? And I, I thought that before the season. I thought this was going to be the year that the Bruins came back to earth, finally. Right. Yeah. And, and you know what? I don't think that's happened to the extent that I expected, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. I think this team is actually better than I thought they'd be hmm. going into this year. I just think the loss of Rask and the loss of David Krejci. I yeah. think David Krejci was a hugely underrated piece for this Bruins yeah, team. Sure. Uh, usually, usually played more at five on five than Bergeron, right? Like he was mm-hmm. really. I know, I know Bergeron was the star and the more yeah, important yeah, yeah. elite player, but like Krejci was kind of the number one center for most of mm-hmm. the last decade in Boston. So, yeah. um, I mean, at the end of the day, the Bruins have some elite pieces like more elite pieces than they should considering how mm-hmm. long they've been good right, right. And bergeron mcavoy marchand pasternak are all elite yeah. players for me and how poorly have, they've drafted as well <laughs> t- totally but if yeah. you have four elite players yeah like if you have four elite players you know you, you still got a shot like yeah. you still got a shot to make noise in the playoffs typically I, I do think that the club's going to need – and, you know, Taylor Hall might be on the fringes. I wouldn't call him elite, but he's mm-hmm. uh, definitely very good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think the prospects for this Bruins team, if they can get better goaltending than they have, um, if Rass comes back, are decent, are pretty yeah. decent. Like, I think this team could be a, a nightmare matchup in the playoffs if they can hang on and get a wild card spot. And I, I wouldn't expect this to be just, like, linear – regression even as Bergeron ages out here a bit which right. at some point it's got to happen I know yeah I know it's I know he's incredible and <laughs> yeah. still plays like he's 21 but like at some point <laughs> at some point that's going to happen and that's going to be an impossible piece to replace right mm-hmm. like one of the most oh, unique sure. defensive centermen yeah. of our time uh so you know it, it's going to be a very interesting few years as the Bruins manage to climb but man have they done a good job Mm-hmm. restocking as they as it's happened and, yeah. and i do think that's going to give them some interesting options and some flexibility to maybe take a step back in a way that is far shorter than the majority of teams in their situation you know have to take right right um so it's a it's an interesting spot to be in and and look i like the bruins i like the bruins a lot more a lot more than their record shows mm-hmm. i think i think they've got a shot to um, you know, be more than just an also ran in the Atlantic yep. if they can start to get goaltending at the rate that we're used to seeing them right. get, right? Like we almost take it for granted. And I know people in Boston take it for granted. I'm not even gonna <laughs> sugarcoat it. But like we we take it for gear granted that Tuka Rask is like 925, 925, 928, 925, 935 and evens, 930, 930 every year. Every year. Yeah. Most teams don't get to live that life. Right, but the Bruins from Tim Thomas to Tukarask yep. have for 15 years, and people mm-hmm. factor it into their analysis. And now you look at the Bruins, and they're like an elite, elite five on five team <laughs> that's getting league average or slightly yeah. worse goaltending. And and it's not fun, it's a lot more like dicey than everything the Bruins have experienced. But Tukarask can't win the big game, right? 
Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. How are you liking it now, huh? Yeah, exactly. It sucks. Like, you go from Tuka Rask to someone else. Oh, my God. You really miss Tuka Rask. Yeah. But Tuka Rask took so much, you know. Uh, Tuka Rask was, the, like, probably the best goalie of the last decade and took so much criticism in the Boston I market. I don't it's, even want to get started. So, <laughs> I know. It's so it's weird. Yeah. And now the moment he's gone, how noticeable is it? How yeah, noticeable? Exactly. Like, like. Oh, no, they won't miss him. Jeremy Swayman. Like, what? What? <laughs> yeah, it kind of brings us full circle. The... Sorry, sorry to ever, sorry to all the townies who had that take, but come yeah. on. Yeah, Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. When you sure, look at sure underlying numbers, not, uh, now. scoring chances, the Bruins, yeah, top five team in pretty much any category at even strength. And, yeah, and then the save percentage. Fly. Anyways, Drance, uh, I can't thank you enough for, for taking some time to, to chat this morning. Hope, uh, yeah, you uh, can withstand all the uh, the notifications on your phone with people blowing it up about the Canucks these days. The, I really appreciate you taking some time to chat. And, yeah, where can people find uh, find all your Canucks coverage? Uh, I'm at The Athletic, uh, Vancouver. That's uh, that's all my Canucks writing. And then I've got the VanCast with Farhan Lalji. I also have the Canucks Hour at Sportsnet 650, and occasionally I, I appear on TV um, during Canucks broadcast. So if you're follow, following the Canucks, you kind of can't miss me. I'll, I'll be around. All right. Well, thanks so much, Ben. And, uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day. Enjoy the uh, the game tonight and whatever the fallout is afterwards. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Ian. Take care, nice man. to catch up with you, man. Yeah, you as well. Cheers. Cheers. All right, a quick word about Bet Online before uh, we tee up this afternoon's game. It's Thanksgiving. We all know what that means. There was football yesterday. Uh, nothing goes better with Black Friday and turkey and leftovers than Bet Online. They have you covered for all your holiday betting this season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. They're your number one spot for uh, hockey, basketball, football, boxing, UFC. And uh, right now you can sign up for their new website interface and get a 50% welcome bonus by using promo code locked on bet online, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports stuffed with Thanksgiving deals. Now uh, let's quickly tee up this afternoon's game against the New York Rangers. Uh, there was some concern obviously after the Buffalo game about Charlie McAvoy boarded by Zemgis Gergensen's. Uh, encouraging that yesterday, Thanksgiving, he carried on the Bruins tradition by donating and delivering hundreds of pies to local organizations, uh, something that was started by Zdeno Chara. Uh, giving back to the community in Boston, he said, it gives you some perspective. On a day like today, makes you even more thankful for what you have. So many amazing people, volunteers, people with big hearts. Um, so yeah, it was amazing to see him up and about doing that. Actually, I should say the tradition started with Aaron Ward in 2008, carried on by Zanino Chara. Uh, Matt Belsky jumped in there for a bit. Gregory Campbell, Dennis Weidman picked it up for a year. And so Charlie McAvoy, A, doing some good work, but also seemingly healthy, uh, which is great news. Jeremy Swayman should get the start. Bruce Cassidy said whoever started on Wednesday would start here today. And, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I will probably jump on and record – Tomorrow to recap this game, preview the game against um, Vancouver on Sunday. But thanks again to Drancer for jumping on uh, and to talk hockey here today. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Enjoy the game this afternoon. And we'll catch you again later here on the Locked On Boston Bruins podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your favorite team every day.